Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Rodeo Time Podcast with your man, Dale Brisby. Yeah, that's right. Today we've got fellow legend, Mr. Tough Hedeman. We got to sit down with him for Panhandle Western Wear. He's been with them since 1986. That's 34 years. That's older than you, Donnie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, by a bunch. Is it older than you? Yeah, also me. Uh, Tough and I, we used to go to different rodeos together. Um... It was a matchup that a lot of people wanted to see, just never happened. Uh, there was one rodeo where we were going to, and then I didn't go. They didn't have enough added. The airline lost my ring and bag. I also forgot to enter. Um, but regardless, we get to sit down, visit with the man about um, traveling partners, the NFR, Bodacious, um, all kinds of stuff, Del Rio. So the last thing he says, the very last thing he says is by far the most important. So I want you to listen to the end, and um, when you hear it, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. It is the most important thing you're going to hear all day, coming straight from Tough Hedeman. So thank you to Panhandle Western Wear for bringing us Mr. Tough Hedeman today. Pow, pow. Enjoy. Those are a pair of Muhammad Ali boxing gloves right there. Really? It's right on the top, right here. Yeah. No, I didn't spar with him. I uh, I got I bought him at some charity auction somewhere one time. Okay. I thought you were gonna say you kicked his ass. Yeah. No, you <laughs> know what? I I I, I, I I I've done some fun, cool things, but kicking Muhammad's ass was not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> The only really cool thing I ever did, I got to fly an F-16 with the Thunderbird, so that was a cool. Cooler than sperm boat Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nothing's cooler than flying a jet at the speed of sound. Do you get sick at all? A lot of people get sick. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I get extremely sick. Everybody gets sick. Yeah. Just, you're, you you're, you're, you're oh, yeah. Compression pants, and you, you you breathe in, and then you exhale. Only try to you know, like fifty percent of what you took in. You go, oh, yeah, and so you like that's it. Yeah, that's to keep. Yeah, no, it's it's to keep from all the blood running out of you know certain parts of your body, so you black out, pass out. I've got a I've got a pen that they that they give you if you pull like nine G's and you don't pass out, you get a pin. But I don't, I don't, I don't know what the ratio is. But uh, yeah, by far the coolest thing ever. Because I actually, I actually got to fly it for about 15 minutes. And once you, once you get to altitude and you got a stick here, it's they're easier to fly than driving a car. It's just everything is right, right here on the stick. When'd you do that? I did it uh, in Cheyenne. I don't know, seven or eight years ago. Dang, so pretty recent. Yeah, actually, I was still staying in contact with one or two of those guys that are that are with them, and I was. Uh, they were in Houston last week or week before last, and they were in Wichita Falls last week, and I was going to try to get up there to see them, but. They, I, was unable to, but it's, uh, yeah, Fly, do, do what they do, that's crazy. So the breathing had no comparison to how you breathe when you're on a bull? Yeah, I don't, I've never factored in breathing when I was riding a bull, but when you're flying an F-16, it's, uh, it's important. It's the difference of you staying awake or taking a nap. <laughs> the sport has changed for better or worse since you started riding bulls till today? Well, I don't, I don't think as much as changed as, you know, 
people want to believe. I think, you know, it, it's a great sport. It's, uh, you know, for, for me and the people that do it and have done it, it's probably the challenge of all challenges. But uh, I, th I think the biggest thing that has changed is the caliber of bulls that guys get on day in and day out. You know, there were a lot of times, you know, when I was riding even professionally that, 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 I, that I got on bulls that just simply, you know, they should have been to McDonald's earlier. They, uh, you know, th that, they all have histories and pedigrees and whatnot, but I think that now the guys get on bulls that, if you're a bull rider, that you, you, wanna, you wanna be competitive every time you ride. You know, you want you want to be at a, a contest of how good you ride, not how lucky you are that day to get this particular bull or that particular bull. So I think I think there's more. Um, I think you have to be when 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 you look at it as a rider, you, you know, you don't have any excuses to me in this day and age of bull riding. If you, if you're not winning and you're not competitive is because you're not riding well enough because the bulls are so good across the board that every time you get to an event bull riding uh, rodeo whatever it is you know you're gonna have a chance to be competitive and that's to me as a competitor that's that's all you want there's nothing more frustrating or disheartening to show up Get on a bull knowing you have no chance to win. Knowing you're getting on a bull that's just no good. You know, he doesn't, you can't, you get, you can't get a high enough score to be competitive. And so that, that's, that's the biggest change. You know, you've got some, you've got some safety issues. You've got safety gear, you know, a vest, which is a huge, huge help. You know, I, I didn't wear a vest until you know, the mid nineties because they just weren't around. Uh, as far as a helmet, I never wore a helmet because they didn't have one that was, you know, specifically designed for, for bull riding. And I had neck issues and even the doctors that, that I was around at the time who were, in my mind were the best in the world was Dr. J. Pat Evans and Dr. Freeman, you know, they didn't want me to wear a helmet that put more weight and more stress and strain on my neck and spine you know everybody thinks that oh yeah automatically that makes you safer but if it has an effect on your neck and spine you know if you get hit in the face you break some bones no big deal six weeks you usually they'll heal but if you put a helmet on and it has an effect on your neck and spine it you know makes a difference as, as to whether you can walk versus riding around in a chair, you know, that's, that's not something you want to do. So other than that, it's, it's the same thing. It's, it's man versus beast for eight seconds, and uh, it makes no sense at all. Uh, but, but for me, it was the most exciting, coolest thing I've ever done. the cowboy mentality that it took to, to ride bulls and be competitive at it? Well, I, I think everybody wants to, everybody wants to be the winner, everybody wants to be the champ. Um, I think the thing, same thing that goes into bull riding is the same thing that goes into anything else. If you want to be good, you know, if you want to be average or you want to be great, it's it's all up to you, and it's you know it's it's how bad do you really want it? It's you know everybody everybody's usually good in a, in a positive environment. You know when the weather's fine, the sun is shining, you feel good, you're healthy. You know it it, it makes it easier, but there there are more days that aren't like that where it's stormy and you're beat up and you're sore and is this really what you want to do? And for, for, for me, 
that that was what I wanted to do all day, every day. And, you know, I always say if if you really want to be great at something, then that's all you do. You know, I don't think Tiger played every sport. He played golf. He's a golfer all day, every day. When he wake when he wakes up in the morning, he's a golfer. When he goes to bed, he's a golfer. And for for, for me growing up, that. That's all I wanted. And I started when I was four years old, riding calves, and I stayed on my first one. I think it was 10 years before I ever stayed on another one. But once I you know, decided that's what I wanted to do, that was me all day, every day. I didn't, I didn't keep up with sports, current events, you know. I, I, I kept up with nothing other than me wanting to go ride Go make the whistle, because if you make the whistle, you win. It's, 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 it's that simple. It doesn't matter where you come from, what your name is, who your parents are. You know, once a gate opens, it's you. And it's more than anything, if, if you're good, it's your fault. But if you suck, it's your fault. And once you understand that, then... You, you take the actions necessary, you know. Nobody wants to suck. Pretty much. Yeah. Um, yeah, just um, talk about the NFR. What was it like nodding your head up out in Vegas and, you know, working for that dream of being at the NFR? What was it like when you, when you first blew off? Getting to, getting to the NFR is the absolute coolest thing you can ever imagine because, you know, growing up, you know, I knew all about the NFR. You know, we didn't have all this, the, the social media and technology that we have today with the rodeo sports news, but I knew exactly who was going to the NFR, you know, I knew who the world champions were, and, you know, I was, you know, those were the guys I wanted to be. And so, when you actually make it, and you know, for, for, for me, it was like, I always wanted to make it, and I never thought that I would ever probably be good enough to, to make it. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a cool thing ever, and so once I made it once, I'm like, I'm, I, wanna, I wanna come here every year for the rest of my life. And so I did my best to do that, and you know, I ended up making it 12 times, I missed my 13th time, I, I think uh, in 97, I, I missed it by, I was 16th, I missed it by 500 bucks, but, you know, going to the NFR, it's the coolest 10 days you can imagine when you're competing, as long as, you, as, long as you're doing good. Uh, when you're not doing good, it, 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 it's, a, it's a roller coaster of emotions that you went around, you think, oh wow, I'm good, I'm great. I'm gonna win the world, and then you get drilled the next night, and you're like, "I suck. I'm terrible. I don't know if I'll ever make the whistle again." It's 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 a it's a different experience than any other rodeo, and you know, there's a the old sports cliche, you know, it's just another rodeo. Take them one at a time, but you know, I just never believed that, it, because to me it wasn't. It was more important. Uh, so in order to to go there and ride, to go there and win, you had to just be dialed in, and you know, there's a lot of things happening around you. There's, you know, your friends, your family, and you know, it's 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 a big deal. And some people just can't take it. You know, I I mean, I know guys that ride great all year long, or even rope great all year long, and once they get to Vegas, it's like it's like the, the oxygen just leaves them and they just, they can't function like they have all year long. And then you got guys that, you know, the bigger the stakes, you know, that just elevates them. And that's just, a, that's, that's, it's, it's a, it's a personal thing. Um, and it's different for everybody. But for me, I just, I love being there. I love the experience. I love everything except getting, getting bucked off. And if you're going to go to the NFR, you're going to get bucked off at some point in time. With, with it being 
10 days and a bigger rodeo and, and how you said it is a big deal. Do you, did you have a specific strategy that you would approach it a little different than the normal rodeo in the year? My strategy was to show up, get on, give it all I had, make the whistle. and Because I knew if I made the whistle, I was going to be happy and in a good mood. And if I didn't make the whistle, it wasn't good. And I, I just hated that feeling of failure. I hated the feeling of losing. And when you lose on the biggest stage, everybody knows. And uh, it was just, yeah, but, but I was always realistic and objective. And I mean, every night, you know, you, you've got, you got 10 nights, so not all 10 nights are gonna be great, not all are gonna be bad. And, and it's just such a, you just have to not get too excited or too disappointed too early. You know, the first year in Las Vegas, uh, you know, I, I, I went in with a $10,000 lead. And that, it, at that time was a lot. And I rode my first five. So if, if the rodeo had been over that day, I would have won the world by 35000 Mind you, that's my second NFR. I'd made it at Oklahoma City, uh, the first, my first NFR, but there was no way that I'm not supposed to win the world. So I'm thinking, well, yeah, I'm going to win the world. And this is like halfway through. And uh, lo and behold, I got bucked off three of my next five. Ted Noose won the, the last round. And he was a world champion, not me. And it, it'd probably go down as the biggest choke job in the history of the NFR. And as miserable as I was, it it made me better because I knew that, you know, from this point forward, you you, you don't know what's going to happen. You you got to show up and every day. It wasn't wasn't that the effort wasn't there, but I I just kind of thought that it was a done deal. Well, the next year I come, got a fifteen thousand dollar lead. I get bucked off my first two, and I was like, oh my gosh, he's choking again. He's like. I can't handle the pressure of the NFR, which clearly I hadn't been able to, to that point. And then I rode eight in a row and won my, won my first title. And, but, you know, that, that was the best learning experience because, you know, I, I went there one year and, you know, I'd, I'd rode like, I think probably seven, seven out of nine going into the 10th round, but I hadn't won anything in the rounds. So I'd won like, you know, five or six thousand, and I get on my last bull, and I'm ninety-two or three. I wind up winning the round. I win maybe, you know, third third in the average. So I go from having six thousand one to almost to fifty thousand one, and that was back. You know, that was, you know, that was in the mid nineties. So. It, you just can't get too excited or too disappointed. You, you just try to hang around all week and give, your ch give yourself a chance, you know, to win it at the end because, you know, one round and the average is a ton. And so you can, you can go from worst to first quickly out there. And I, I think that's what makes it exciting for, for the fans. It's, it's a little, it's a little trying when, you know, it's not a big deal until it's you, but you just kind of have to stay within yourself and enjoy the fact that you're at the NFR, but remember the fact that it's up to you to, to compete and to do what you know how to do, which is make the whistle and win. So I know this question might be one that you get asked a lot. And I don't, I don't I think you've answered it. I've seen interviews where you've answered it before, but I thought it might be neat to panhandle and say, well, how did you get the name Tough? Well, there was, a, there was an old cowboy that uh, his name was Tater Decker, and he, you know, he was an old steel wrestler, and, the, you know, he was, you know, part of the RCA, part of the Turtles and in New York, and he was a friend of my, my, my dad's, and uh, being the youngest of seven, I think, if your parents get a chance to you, you go hang out with somebody else for a little while, that's not a bad thing. So I, 
I, I used to hang out with him, and we went out and got in his truck, and I jumped in, and I reached back to close the door, and he walked by, and he shut the door, and he shut it on my hand, and so my hand was in between the door and the vehicle, and I don't say anything, but I'm like, this really hurts, and he, he, he walks around, and he gets in, he says, he looks over, and he sees his hole, he jumps out, and he runs around there, and opens it, and there's like, it's not blood or anything, but my fingers are just, have these creases across there, and he said, are you okay, and I just nodded my head, I'm okay, are you going to cry, and I shook my head, no, and he said, well, you're a tough nut, so he started calling me tough nut, and uh, I think I was probably four or five at the time. And, you know, I wish that wouldn't have happened because it's, you know, growing up with a name, you know, later is short and tough, but, you know, it's like being a boy named Sue, you know, because no matter what, people start judging you and talking to you, like, you don't look so tough to me, or I'll show you what tough is, and it's, it's, it's not all that fun to have a name where people just simply give you a hard time just because of your name knowing nothing about you. And with that name, you have a choice of, you can, you can either just turn and walk away, of which they harass you more, or you have to fight. And I never was that good at walking away. Well, I always like to rodeo with guys that that had the same goals and ideas that, that I had, you know, and that mean, you know, I love to be around guys that were really good because I wanted to be good. And so fortunately, I was always around guys that, you know, that, that's who I always tried to, you know, be with and hang out with. But, you know, rodeo and bull riding very much is an individual sport, but you know, whenever, you know, whenever I got started and started riding, you know, full time, you know, my, my favorite group of guys was Lane Frost, Jim Sharp, and Clint Bronger. Uh, and, and those were good times. Those were fun times. Because while we weren't part of a team, we felt like we were part of a team. Because we weren't, we weren't, like, upset or mad if if I didn't win I knew one of those guys was going to win and so I mean you know I I, I feel bad for Clint Bronger because he's the best guy I've ever seen to never win a world championship I mean there's no way that he should not have won a world championship but he didn't you know he came probably a second away from winning one one time but he didn't but from, I, I think, 86 like to 91, if I didn't win it, that was fine. As long as one, one, of, one, of, my, one of my partners won it. Like, I won it in 86, Lane won it in 87, Jim won it in 88, I won it in 89, uh, Jim won it in 90, and I won it in 91. So there was about a five-year run that w we knew that the, that the world championship was Going, going, going in our van. What was it like, like entering back in the day? Like nowadays, these guys have. They have that same thing. I mean, they can just call in Procom on their cell phone, like right there. Like you guys had that. Well, we 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 didn't have it bad. You know, it, it wasn't as prehistoric as you know a lot of people think. You know, they did have telephones. They did have a toll-free number, but it's it's still the fact of you know, you, you get the sports news. You look. You know, it was pretty simple for me. I said, where are the rodeos that have the most money? So that's, that's where we went. Didn't matter if they were in, you know, in Fort Worth or they were in Pinocchio, Alberta, or they were in Kissimmee, or they were in Redding, California. Didn't, didn't matter. We, we figured out a way to get there. And, you know, we were all, you know, pretty early on, 
you know, we were all competitive and we, we won enough to, you know, like we didn't have to drive like nonstop, you know, we flew most of the time, you know, when it was a long ways off and, um, but I was, I was, I was the one that kind of mapped out where we were going and how we were getting there. And, you know, Jim Sharp used to say, you know, I, they say, where are you going? And he said, I don't know where they tell me to go. So that was, that was fine, but it was, it, it was fun. It was, it, it was good. You know, we had, we had, each of us usually had a van that, you know, if we drove, you know, you know, we might, we might drive to Denver and then get on a plane and fly around here, there and yonder. And actually Jim and I had an airplane for a couple of years that, that, we, that we flew that made it a little easier. But, you know, the main thing, you know, we, we figured out a way to get there one way or another. When uh, I remember watching a video um, Del Rio that Lou Lima had put together, you guys land in, in your airplane, and I think it might have been 91 or 92. Mm -hmm. But uh, talk, maybe talk about the experience in Del Rio, um, maybe Mac's bull ridings and just the atmosphere. You know, Mac Altizer probably, you know, he, he, he did as much for, for bull riding and rodeo, you know, he made it cool and fun, you know, a party. And, you know, for us that were riding, you know, we wanted to get there and just ride and win. You know, but he always created an atmosphere that, you know, this was the place to be. You know, this was the happening place. And so going going to Del Rio was always fun. It was the first standalone bull riding. It was a it was a tribute to George Paul. You know who you know one of the greatest bull riders ever. Who you know had a streak of I don't know I think it was seventy nine and zero whatever. Um, and it, it was it, it was fun. It, it was an outdoor event. It was right on the Mexican border, and they used to have a big Calcutta where they'd go over uh, to Acuna. And uh, it was it, it was a good time, and it was a good time for not just you know the people that were riding competing or part of the rodeo or bull riding, you know, the, the fans loved it because it was a, it was a show. It was a, it was entertaining. You know, you didn't have to know anything about bull riding to go to Del Rio and have a good time. Did Del Rio kind of, like during that time and having standalone bull ridings, did that kind of put a vision in all, like the group of guys that you were around at the time, like for what was next to come in the sport of bull riding? Well, I, I, you know, they were by far and away the, the first standalone event that that invited the top guys and tried to get you know the best bulls that they could, and you know that that's that's a recipe that you know bull riding's cool, it, you know, to to watch it. You don't have to know anything about it, and so I think that was you know that that was the beginning of it. They they they're the ones that started it, and um, you know when we started doing. Uh, standalone bull riders. It, it w wasn't that we were against a rodeo. You know, bull riders. You you got a pretty short. You know, most guys have a you know pretty short career. Uh, so you want to you want to win as much as you can and be as competitive as you can. You know, while you're doing it, and you know, and there were just some frustrating things that. You know, again, showing up and getting on a bull that you know, you can't you can't. You can make the best ride you can, but you're still not going to win because the bull's no good. Um, can you tell me just a little bit about, you, you, you mentioned being 16th one year by $500, like maybe a year where you're on the bubble and, and what those last couple of months look like rodeoing compared to maybe where you're, you're going into the end of the season sitting in the top five. You know, the, the, the last year I tried to qualify for the NFR, I missed it by $500. And the reason I didn't make it is because I didn't ride good enough. The year before, I'd only went to 18 rodeos and made it. But I won Houston and Cheyenne. And at that time, you know, I was, you know, going to, you know, that was, that was right around the time, you know, where we had created the PBR and I was riding not only at those events, but I... I was president, and so there were other things going on. And the reason I didn't make the NFR is because I, I just didn't ride good enough. You know, I went 35 rodeos, and I 
miss it by 500 and people say well you just didn't go to enough rodeos i said no i just didn't ride well enough and you know i was getting up in years and uh i would have never acknowledged or admitted at the time but i didn't ride as good as i did five years previously because if i did i would have made them and you know it's it, it's a crappy feeling that I've never had, which is wanting to make the NFR and not making it. I'm not, I know what that feels like now. I didn't ever want that feeling again, but I, I never got the opportunity to, to make him again. The following year it was 98 and actually at the first of March, I was winning the PRCA and the PBR. And I, su I suffered another neck injury and Dr. Freeman basically told me that if, uh, if you have the same injury an, another level up, then you're going to be Christopher Reeves or dead. And I know how much you love your boys, and that's just something to think about. So when he told me that, I'm like, I'm good, I'm done. And looking back, you know, I, I rode professionally for 15 years, which still, you know, doesn't, you know, there's not very many people that are able to do that. You know, I made the NFR 12 times, and I had fun every bit of the way. Can you tell us about this red bull on your wall? Uh, the, the, the bull on the wall, his name was uh, Whiplash. They renamed him Palace Station uh, as part of a sponsorship deal, but he was, uh, I think I got on him six or seven times and every time I got on him I rode him and won I was always 87 to 90 points and he was kind of undersized but he was a uh, he was he was a gritty just never give up you know he bucked off a lot of guys that you know he was very rideable but if you would like sub your toe he'd buck you off you know, he bucked off Adriano Marias back when Adriano Marias never got bucked off. You know, he's, you know, he was the first Brazilian guy to come over here, and to this day is probably one of the best Brazil has ever seen. And uh, whenever uh, his owner retired him, I, I told him if he would let him come live here, that would take good care of him, and and I did. So he he lived out in my pasture for the last couple of years of his life. Uh, what's can, you, can you talk about, so Milano Panhandle Team signed Clayton Sellers this year, mm -hmm. and he's going into his first NFR. What advice do you have for these younger guys? And I know on your tour you see a lot of these young guns that come up red hot and <clears> they're <throat> flirty and how, and how that is, the energy and the promise of that for a first year qualifier. Oh, I, I, I think when you make the NFR, the, the best advice I can say is this you're there for a reason it's not an accident that you made it but first and foremost get on and make the whistle do do what you did to get there you know it's not like you change anything or everything and you know it, it's fun everything is cool about it just once you walk into Thomas and Mac you know it's business as usual uh, with maybe a couple explanations, exclamation, whatever the fuck that said. No, I mean, it's just, you, you, you show up and you, 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 you don't, you don't, you don't give up, you know, you just go do what you do. You know, you, it's not like you won a lottery. You, you had a lottery ticket. That's why you're at the NFR. You're at the NFR because you're one of the best at what you do. So go do what you do. And as long as you show up and you give it all you got all day, every day, every night, you show up, um, that's, all, that's all that really matters. It's, it's okay not to, to win because more times than not, you're not going to win. It's just not okay not to show up and give it everything you have. And that's the most important thing to me is give it all you got every, every night, every time. And then you live with the results. Everybody wants to win, but not everybody does. Can you tell us 
one of your more memorable moments throughout your career that maybe you find yourself thinking about more often than others? Um, you know, I, 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 I rode bulls, you know, at the highest level for a long time. And it's, it's kind of weird to me that, you know, looking back, it, you know, you know, people get, you know, burn out mentally or physically, you know, something just breaks down that you just don't want to do it or you can't do it anymore. And, you know, f for me, that just didn't happen. You know, it really never got old to me. You know, I never got tired of it. I remember guys would say, gosh, I'm, I'm sore, I'm tired of traveling. And I'm like, I would always think, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not tired of any of it. I would be tired if I went back home and had to get a real job. That's when I would have be, became tired. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I enjoyed it. I loved every bit of it. It was, you know, yeah, there was good, bad, and ugly, you know, but I have a lot more good memories than bad, you know. I got, I made a living doing what I love to do. It's, it's the coolest, most challenging thing I could think of. And, uh, you know, I guess for me, the, the most important thing is I never wanted to be a guy that, like, I've seen guys that would say, you know, I, I, I wish I would have tried this or I wish I had done this. And, you know, I, I tried as long as I could, as hard as I could. And, Till I was done, and you know, people say, "Do you miss it?" And I, I don't, I don't miss it for me, you know, because I'm done. I did it for a long time. I'm now. I'm just a fan. I enjoy watching, you know, Sage Kamsey, Clayton Sellers, all these guys that that did what what I did or wanted to do. And you know, again, I'm I, I, I'm a fan. It's it's not easy to do it. You know, it's it's not it's not a gimme. You know. Again, if 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 you win, it's your fault, and if you lose, it's your fault. It's n nothing, nothing else. You know, it, to me, it's the purest thing you can do. It's all black and white. You make the whistle, or you don't. It's not it's it's not like in business where there's some gray area. No, it's pretty black and white. Can you tell us about bronc riding? Well, when I when I I grew, I grew up rodeoing, so I you know I started roping when I was probably eleven or twelve, and then I started riding Bronx, you know, when I was fourteen or fifteen. So I I grew up wanting to be a cowboy, wanting to do everything, and you know I got to where I could rope pretty good. Um, I rode Bronx pretty good, you know. I went to the high school finals a couple of years. I got a, a college scholarship. I actually filled my permit riding Bronx. I loved riding Bronx, uh, but I, I I couldn't turn my toes out very good, and that's, you know, I was just almost good. I was good till the real guys showed up. You know, whenever the Ep Bowers and Clint Johnson and you know Brad Germanson and those guys showed up, then then I was kind of a, you know, I, I was an also ran, but I actually filled my permit riding Bronx. Uh, Loved it, but even the first year or two I made the NFR, I, I entered the Bronx riding a lot. Then I placed it, some good rodeos. You know, I, I think I won second, second or third at Cheyenne one year, and uh, it, it, it's fun. But you know, bull riding became, you know, my focus and my passion. And uh, one day I just came to the realization about my Bronx riding it. You know. You're just good enough not to be good, so I left my saddle and just rode bulls. Can you uh, can you think of are there any like pranks you guys pulled on each other that, that stand out in your mind? Probably not. I, there's probably not, not any pranks that I could really talk about because our idea of a, of a of a prank was probably not other people's idea of a prank because. Uh, let's see. Well, if you want to share one, I'm just, I would like to hear one. Um, Jim Sharp was fun whenever he came around as a rookie because he 
he was the most sheltered, quiet person I've ever met in my life. And so you could, you could tell him anything and he, he would believe it. And uh, I guess the, the, we used to have, I used to have fun with Lane Frost in that he could never remember people's names. And, and how could he? Because everybody that, that he ever met, you know, they were his best friend in their eyes. But sometimes he couldn't remember their name, and so he would come over and he would say, like, what's his name? And he'd say, Wilbur. And so he'd be, like, talking to him, he'd say, yeah, Wilbur. And the guy would look at him like this. And, but, but, but once he figured out that we were doing that to him, he never asked again <laughs> what, what their name was. <laughs> so you said you did the inner does that mean you were the most responsible one in the car you know that being the most responsible one in our car didn't you know didn't carry that much merit I mean can consider the field <laughs> no I'm, I'm good um, if there's anything else that you have, have said that you think you've never actually shared that you want to that you or... want to share um, no I, I think the most important thing for me is that you know, I, I, I've had the best life I could ever imagine. You know, I, I never thought I would be good enough to be a world champion, ever. Uh, I just know that I tried as hard as I could for as long as I could. And if you do that, you know, you never know what, what, what can happen. And, uh, you know, people ask me how, how, how I'm doing and, oh, I bet you hurt when you get out of bed. And, and I don't. I feel fine. I, I, uh, my life is my kids. Uh, my two older boys are, you know, they're grown, but now I've got Riker, and uh, I'm still the luckiest guy I've ever met. Uh, not to say that everything has been perfect all the time, but for the most part, it's good. You know, I get paid to wear cowboy clothes, okay? You know, panhandle. I've been in and around those guys, the Hawkshire, since 1986. And I always say that, you know, they treat me like family, but they actually treat me better than family. Uh, I'm always welcome. They make the best of everything. And uh, I always, I owe them a lot because they've never done anything. And, Hopefully, hopefully, I, I do something every now and then that makes somebody want to buy a Panhandle shirt. I'm good. Twenty-three minutes. What do you think of that Dale Brisby bull rider? I'm not saying Dale Brisby's the best I've ever seen, but he's got to be top three. I hope you enjoyed that uh, podcast. You heard it from the man himself. Um, so it's it's truth. Tuff Hedeman said it. Dale Brisby said it. And um, now we're on to the next one. But I wanted to let you know, thank you for listening this long. And if you have, then that means you're, you're a fan of bull riding, you're a fan of Tuff Hedeman, you're a fan of Dale Brisby. So what I want you to do is pull out your iPhone or Samsung, if you're like Donnie and living in the Stone Ages, and text me. 940-353-0890 and I, I respond to anywhere from 20 to 200 people a day and um, I'd love to visit with you and it is me responding it's not Donnie it's Dale Brisby and so let's skip the the three text messages where I'm trying to convince you that it's me let's just visit okay um, also DaleBrisby.com check it out I love you I miss you we'll see you on the next episode